right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mark, and thank you Scrum Masters of the Universe for having me today. It is blazing hot here in Charlotte. I haven't been outside, but I've heard it's about to be about 105. Um, I'm going to share my screen. We're going to get started with my presentation. And as Mark also said, please keep me honest. Let me know if you can see it. Um, because as he shared, I've done slideshow presentations without sharing at all and nobody tells me so um all right let's play play from the start here okay well i'm excited to be sharing my ideas here today with you folks on connecting science to the world of corporations and corporate america i'll give you a little bit about my background in just a moment but this is the second opportunity for me to practice this in preparation for doing this at the Serious Scrum Conference coming up in September. So I'm really excited to have an opportunity to iterate my ideas, to improve on um, what I have here for you today and get it ready for that big giant audience on September 13th. So, all right, so the title of my talk here today is Using Newton's Laws to change organizational culture. So here's the gentleman in question for today, Sir Isaac Newton. You probably recall, if you reach back many years um, to science class, he's the guy who had the apple fall on his head under the tree, and that gave him this burst of scientific ideas. He was a physicist, a mathematician, an astronomer, an alchemist, which I didn't know until I looked that up, um, and also an author who shared his ideas. Now, looking at him and looking at this list, you might say to yourself, well, how does somebody become an expert in all of these things? Well, keep in mind during the Enlightenment, we had much less knowledge on these subjects, but it was critical that someone like him understand all of these things in order to come to his conclusions. But did you know that he was an expert in organizational change and agility as well? You probably didn't know that because I made that up. <laughs> no, um, a few months ago, I, you know, I'm always in this process of deep thinking and I was thinking about what I was witnessing in front of me going on in the company I was working in at the time. And I started thinking about some other concepts I'll talk to you about in a moment, but then it connected it back to physics for me and other scientific concepts. And I was like, huh, there's something here. So who am I and how did I come to those crazy conclusions? Well, my name is Patty, as Mark mentioned. I have a bachelor's degree in geology and a master's in science education. So I have a vast science background. Um, you might be familiar with the Big Bang Theory where Sheldon Cooper says geology is not a real science. I fundamentally disagree. I had to study all sorts of subjects, including math and, and computer science to really understand how the world works. And as my education probably indicates, I was passionate about sharing this and my excitement for this with others. So I went and I got my master's degree from Harvard University. Um, more about that in just a moment. But I started out my career as a middle school science teacher. And I was passionate to share with 13 and 14 year olds the um, wonders of the world. And as you might imagine, if some of you have those folks in your house, um, they're not super excited about that. So after a year, I realized I need to step out of the front of the classroom and start teaching them to become owners of their education, um, have a student-centered classroom. And this was actually, this came to me because of the fundamental things that they teach at Harvard Graduate School of Education. They want you to be a guide on the side, so to speak, not a sage on the stage. So in my um, years of teaching middle school, I realized that I was implementing Scrum and Agile practices. So I was doing this before it was a thing and before I realized what I was really doing, but it was only many years later 
when I became a scrum master and an agile coach that I realized I had all the experience I needed in order to do these roles. So in the recent years, I've been a scrum master and agile coach across many industries, both software and non, and I've worked many different company sizes. So I have a breadth of experience, including being a solopreneur myself. So I am the founder of Agile Mindset Consulting. I walk the walk and I really try to hold myself accountable to that. I run my business as a scrum team of one. I use JIRA, so I've graduated from Trello, but um, I use JIRA and I have adapted what you would do as a team to myself only. Um, I do Scrum Master Coaching because I am passionate about that. And I've developed what you might have seen is called the Scrum Simulator. And this is a cohort-based training course to help people learn how to step into their Scrum Master role. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please reach out to me. Um, I also go into corporations and I help them evaluate where they are in their transformation and how to take the challenging next steps to get them to move along their path, right? Because it's, it's too easy to quit. All right, so let's get to the meat of the discussion here. Often, when you go into that Scrum Master role, you will start to hear people talk about org structure, culture, and which is easier to change, one or the other. And what I fundamentally realized, it's a little bit of both. You kind of got to do both at the same time. And it's somewhat of a chicken or egg situation. You have these things in motion. You kind of have to work on them at the same time. But people will often pick one or the other because, you know, you just got to pick something. So let's start with the organization. Now, my fancy Agile Coaching Certification, um, Enterprise Business Agility, um, the, the, the consensus in that course that I took was you got to start with structure. Structure is easier to change. You move some people around on the org chart. You give people new titles. You now report to this person. Let's do some training with you. And bam, we are agile. But... Let me move this so I can read my slides. Okay, but organizational changes are not as easy as we want to believe. If you work in a large organization that has a big corporate structure, you will probably notice when you start to talk about org change, people panic. People start to feel like their job is in jeopardy. They don't know where they fit in anymore. The rumor mill starts going, there's gonna be layoffs. Like this is just this constant cycle that goes around. And this strikes fear in people's heart. You gotta do it sometimes, but typically organizations are very judicious on how frequently they do this. So what are we left with? Culture, right? But as you probably know, changing culture is really difficult. You will come into an organization and this will happen if you're a contractor, this happens like every year, every two years, and you will realize that changing culture is very difficult. There is a lot of invisible things going on in that company that you don't re realize is there until you start stepping on people's toes. And I've had this happen so many times because I've been a contractor for a long time. People will default to their usual behaviors and communication patterns because that's what's comfortable for them. So even if you change the org chart, even if you retrain people, even if you tell people now we're coming to these scrum meetings instead of, you know, all these other meetings, guess what? They are going to default to those well-worn paths. And you will probably notice that when you start nudging them towards forming new ones, they get kind of annoyed. They get frustrated at you. They push back. They might be resistant. They might refuse to participate. So what do you do? Well, unfortunately, what happens in a lot of places is that the results don't happen. Transformation doesn't occur or it stalls and people get really frustrated 
and then they give up. They say Agile doesn't work here. Scrum or other frameworks doesn't work here. We're giving up. The interesting thing is I've been in companies that are like, oh, we're on our third Agile transformation now. <laughs> so obviously they see value in it, but they ultimately get stuck and they don't know what to do. And you might start to feel like this as a scrum master, you're sitting at your desk, you know, you have your, um, I have two screens, but you know, you have um, people coming at you, they're very angry. I don't wanna say they're gonna shoot you with lasers, but sometimes it might feel like that. But you start to feel like that there's too much here. It's a Pandora's box. It's out of my control. I can't do anything to change around here, change things around here. So what do you do? You might leave the company or you might say, hmm, maybe it's my role to push past this impediment and figure out what to do about it. So like I mentioned, a few months ago, I started thinking about this because this was going on where I was working. And I started reaching back into some of my prior experience and I landed on Isaac Newton. So let's take a look at what he had to say. Now you might remember he has these three laws. So we're gonna talk about the three laws and then I'm gonna give you a little bit about what my physics professor taught me to look at in order to help you understand how this directly applies to what you're seeing in your company today. And you do have more control than you think. So here's um, our Mr. Isaac Newton once again. And if you recall, his first law states, an object will not change its motion unless a force acts on it. Now, I wanna be very clear. He uses the word force here. I realize this is a bad word in the Agile community. Nobody wants to be forced to do anything. Nobody wants to go in and force change. So I wanna change this to the word influence. So an object, a person, a team, a company, will not change unless an influencer acts on it. Well, guess what? You're that, that influencer. So this is the first law. Let's move to the second law. And notice the picture's different. Do we really know what he looked like? I don't know. I didn't want to use the same picture over and over. So you'll see he changes, but this is also Isaac Newton. His second law states force equals mass times acceleration. So acceleration is a constant, 9.8 meters per second squared, or for those of us in the US, 32 feet per second. So what that tells you is the bigger the mass, the greater the force. The bigger the mass, the greater the influence needed. So this is where my physics professor <laughs> comes in. Anytime we did examples in class or anytime we had to do all those calculations, he always related, related it back to playing pool. So I want you to imagine yourself. You're that person that's blurry in the background there. You have that cue stick and your goal is to influence that 11 ball. So you're gonna aim and you're gonna shoot. Hopefully the 11 ball moves straight ahead as you want it to, maybe it goes into the pocket. But if you're not intentional with your movement, with your energy, with your angle, with the necessary force, that 11 ball may not react in the way that you hope. So what I wanna to stress to you here is there needs to be force to move an organization to become agile. There needs to be influence to make that 11 ball move forward. I wanna to stress to you Scrum Masters though, you cannot do it alone. It is not all on your shoulders because your organization is not the size of an 11 ball. Your organization is huge. There are many other balls, so to speak, in the way, possibly between you and that 11 ball. So you can't do it alone. Don't expect yourself to change an entire organization. 
But you need to understand you do have control. You can influence change. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about how. So let's go to his third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So when you put something out there, whether it's your energy, whether it's a thought, whether it's an action, whether it's something you say, you will get a reaction in response to it. Keeping in mind that nothing is also a reaction. So back to our pool player here, what do you do when you realize you're in front of a team and you are like, I need them to do X. <laughs> First of all, do they realize they need to do that? Is that in their best interest? Do they realize there is a problem? But you do have to have some courage to understand you can influence and you just need to be intentional about it. Realizing that any reaction is a reaction, it's neutral, it's not good or bad, you're the one that puts judgment on it. So you might look at this person sitting in this um, pool hall and say, wow, he's really backed into a corner, or she, I don't know what she's going to do about this. First of all, what do you think his or her end result is? Because that's where the conscious intention needs to be in order to hit that cue ball to react in the way that quote unquote, you're, you're hoping. So we'll get to that in a minute. So I wanna put that in air quotes for the moment. But if you look, that person might just wham that ball and it will go straight and not influence anything, right? That's a possibility. The person might get angry. I tried, why didn't they react and get angry at them? But what you have to do is take a step back and realize that you need to change your action. If you want a different reaction, if you want to hit that yellow striped ball, you need to inspect and adapt. And this is the concept of retrospection and iteration, agile principle number 12. Take a step back, inspect and adapt your angle, your energy, your force because you want that yellow ball to move, not the orange one. And instead of getting mad at the orange one for not moving, maybe you need to in adjust your action to get it to move. So I wanna pause there and say, do we have any questions at this point? How's this landing? And should we add to this? Are you ready? Because there's more. So Jamie posted in the in the chat if anybody had any questions. I don't see any yet, Patty, but yeah, if you have questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. And of course, like like every good coach out there, I just sit there and wait. <laughs> Right, but I talk about walking the walk and that's what I need to do. I need to walk the walk. So if there are no questions at this moment, um, or if you wanna hold them to the end, feel free to do that, but I'm gonna move on to the next concept because this does get more complicated as you probably imagine. So now we need to look at a concept called systems thinking, because keep in mind that you affect somebody but that person goes off and affects somebody else. So there is a downstream effect of what you do that when you start to become an agile coach, you need to consider. So there might be a simple solution such as I need to hit the red ball and then my problems or my team's problems will be solved. However, that solution may impact somewhere else in the organization that you may not have considered or your team may not have considered. So you may need to hit that red ball differently, understanding that that red ball is then going to hit the orange ball. And this is where it takes a whole new level of understanding how systems operate with each other 
And this is where understanding business comes into play because it's not just about your team and what your team is delivering. The people in the org structure above you are concerned about other things than just that one feature or just that one piece of software. So having the courage to take a step back and think about how does my solution affect everyone else is another level. And it may take going out and having conversations with people outside your team to understand why are they not considering my solution, right? Instead of getting upset about it, going out and having those courageous conversations and saying, you know, this is what my team came up with. Can you kind of help me understand how it impacts the rest of the organization so we can understand if this solution is viable or not? So another level of systems thinking here, and here's our friend Kermit the Frog, your one team's action may hit a whole bunch of balls, so to speak. Those balls scatter and then all interact with other things and other people. So one action creates a huge ripple effect. And if you've ever played pool, when you, when you break that set of balls, you probably realize, oh yeah, that makes complete sense. But this again is action, reaction. You might need to take a step back and think about, okay, I'm about to unleash something here. I need to be, be more thoughtful about how I'm acting and realize that once you've unleashed this, you may not have any control over it, right? That's out of your sphere of influence. And that's okay, because again, you can't do it alone. Once you see all these reactions, going and talking to these individual people and seeing what the results are. But here's another layer to this, right? In reality, there is only one pool table and you have many, many people trying to play a game on this table. And what I mean by that is you have this gentleman on the right, he looks like he's playing his own game. Here you have somebody else sitting there on the left considering, huh, how can I help that person? <laughs> Maybe I'll go take a stab at his cue ball after he hits it, right? And then you have multiple people trying to tackle the same issue. Maybe they both have good intentions, but if they don't stop to think how their actions interact with each other and what the effects are, it may create a lot of chaos. You also may have people plunking different cue balls down on the same pool game, trying to hit it from different angles. Again, this introduces chaos. And what that does is it stirs up fear. People see this chaos. They feel like it's out of control. I have no influence. This person's a jerk because they hit my cue ball. Um, and then people start operating from a very emotional place. And people in the state of fear tend to make very poor decisions. And I will raise my hand and I will own that as well. So taking a step back, keeping yourself out of that emotion is something we're going to talk about in just a moment. So I'm going to stop here before we get into emotional intelligence. And again, sit here and wait for a couple of moments. Does anybody have any response before we kind of get into solutions, so to speak? Hey, good afternoon. So um, you may get into this when solutions are, are further on. Is there any rec resource that you would recommend uh, learning more about systems thinking? Yeah, that's a great question. I've watched some great LinkedIn learning courses on it. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what they are. So um, thank you for your grace with that. But I, um, I've definitely done my own research and it's, it's, it's a really complex topic that is fascinating to me because of this very reason. You have a lot more control over it than you imagine, but once you unleash, once you do your part, it's almost like you have to see how things play out. Um, there's a book, 
and this is a while ago, meaning many years ago, and I, I'm going to need to get off the call and, and send this book to Mark because I can't think of it. It's like not on the tip of my brain, but it has to do with this. And it was the, the gentleman, I saw him speak here in Charlotte. He used to work for a bank here. Now he works for Amazon, but he, he talked about this in his work in uh, General Motors. So I'm saying this out loud because it's going to trigger my memory and I will send that book to Mark so he can pass it on to you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your grace there. Um, all right. Let's, let's get into the emotional intelligence. This is something that I started talking about years ago and I felt like it didn't land because maybe people, it wasn't on their radar yet. I think the pandemic has made us all take a step back because we are now and possibly still, um, looking into people's bedrooms with kids running around, um, spouses running around, partners running around, you know, all these crazy things that went on that we were actually witnessing in people's backgrounds to give us empathy for what they deal with. It, it brings humanness to the people that we work with. And we started having, um, some conversations with each other we may not have had. We may have started having conversations with ourselves that we may not have had. And I think things have fundamentally changed in terms of what people are ready to start talking about in large corporations. Emotional intelligence being one of them. So we'll dig into the, the, the parts of this in just a moment, but in a nutshell, it's balancing your emotions with your logic but really taking a step back and looking at yourself, taking ownership of you in order to change how you respond to other people. Because as I mentioned, you put out an action, you will get reactions. So you change what you do, you will start to get different reactions and responses from people. So this can have a profound effect on your team. And I, I living example, because I've seen it with, with myself and my own teams when I put myself out there, how much the energy and culture of the team changes. But then you can go outside of your teams and start having an effect on your company. So there, there are three ways to affect organizational culture. On the individual level, which is the one that you have the most control over, because you can only affect you, um, team and organization. So let's start with the individual. And this is where the emotional intelligence comes in. And especially if you start to branch into agile coaching, this becomes a huge topic of discussion. Having an immense amount of self-awareness. So taking a step back and realizing this is what I do. This is what I put out to the world. This is how I come across to people. This is the energy that I put out is having self-awareness. Then the next step is, okay, if I'm not getting the positive response that I want, what do I need to change about myself? Because that's all I can control. What can I change about myself to get a different response from people? This takes internal motivation. You have to want to change in order to affect change. Because if you can't do it, how can you model the behavior so other people see that it is safe to do the same? I've often, as a scrum master and a coach, had to put myself out there, be vulnerable, go first, as they say, and sometimes there's no response initially, but I have to keep doing it. And eventually people will start breaking down their walls, sharing what they're struggling with. Then they start sharing with the team and then the team starts feeling safe. And then you have psychological safety, but this is my internal motivation to make the change that this starts with. Empathy is maybe another cliche buzzword that we hear everywhere, but it's getting to know people on a human level 
So you can put yourself in their shoes. So when you coach them, you can successfully ask them the powerful questions to help them change themselves. But you got to understand people first, and it might be uncomfortable for you to put yourself out there to start building those relationships. And when I've gone into companies, the people that give me the most resistance, that I'm like, this person hates my guts, that's the person that I need to build the relationship with the most. Because that's going to take time. That's going to take perseverance on my end. But when I have that impact on that person, it is something to be celebrated. The final piece is the social skills. And again, this is going out, getting to know other people, putting yourself out there, and changing the way you do things. And I will tell you that, that this was huge for me because I, I don't know if I used to be, or I am, or I'm still not sure at this point, but I was a big introvert. Nobody believes me when I tell them this now, but I was a big introvert. I used to sit in the back of the room, say nothing. I only talked to the people that I perceived liked me, that I got along with. I hated small talk, like the typical introvert stuff. And I really had to push myself out of my comfort zone in order to break some of those patterns that were holding me back. And I think at this point, I'm probably an ambivert. But what I put out there is a lot of extroverted behavior. And I've learned how to do it. It doesn't drain me like it used to. But what I will say is I need to make sure that I take the time to recover. Because at my heart, <laughs> I'm still an introvert. So um, it's building those social skills to learn how to interact with all sorts of types of people to help you coach all types of people. All right, let's move on to the team. Let me check my time. Okay. Um, so on the team level, again, you absolutely can have an impact on your team by modeling the behavior. But for team level work, hold effective scrum events. That may mean different things to different people, especially to your team, but have the courageous conversations with your team, especially in your retrospective, to say, how are we doing with these? How can we make them more powerful? Get them to talk out loud, and they will start to feel comfortable giving and receiving feedback. And this will help drive the inspect and adapt and the continuous improvement of your team. They will start to feel psychologically safe because it is a safe space to have tough conversations. They will see they don't get fired. They don't get in trouble. <laughs> Nothing bad happens, but only good happens by resolving conflict. And as your team navigates conflict, it becomes an emotionally intelligent unit. So they start to operate as one. But again, this takes a lot of vulnerability and hard work on your part as a Scrum Master. Finally, organization. Now you might have a small organization. You may have a giant organization. But having the courage to go outside the team and just start talking to people about emotional intelligence. And it doesn't have to be from a place of, I need to go tell you about this new thing, or I need to run a workshop because I need to educate you all on this emotional intelligence stuff because you're messing things up big time. What it's about is going to leaders and say, you know, hey, my team came up with this solution and I'm not sure how it's going to impact the larger organization. Can you, can you kind of share with me so I can go back to my team and I can have a conversation because they're kind of frustrated. And by this, you're opening that line of communication with that leader or with that person that you might be intimidated by. And you're showing them that you are reflective, that you want to understand what's beyond you and beyond your team, and they will start to see you in a different way. Then when you come to them and say, 
I have a suggestion. I was thinking about this because you have that relationship with them. They might be more willing to listen and try something out. So again, this comes down to building relationships, but going outside your team and outside your comfort zone to affect those leaders. And yes, it will take a long time. Like this is a marathon, not a sprint. You got to be in this for the long haul. Um, but then those folks will reflect on themselves and then they will go out and impact the people beyond them. And you can see how this is a grassroots or a ground up solution where you definitely can have impact on your company. So to address the tension between changing culture or structure, use Newton's laws, keep them in mind, right? The first one is there's no action without some type of influence. And you've got to have that courage to produce that influence. Number two, F equals MA. So understanding it could take a lot of influence to move the needle in your company. And having the courage and the perseverance to move through those impediments within you that want to stop you from doing that. And then finally, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you want to change the reaction you get, you have to have the courage to change your action. But you must be the first domino that pushes this along. Because if you don't do it, who is going to? So thank you. And I open this up for questions, reflections, uh, whatever you might have for me. Wow. Thanks, Patty. Awesome. Awesome. I greatly enjoyed this. This was a uh, great and a challenging, um, challenging talk that you had. Who has questions for Patty? This is a make the most of this opportunity. I see some hands up. Um, Avi. Hi, uh, I'm Abby uh, from uh, Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Patty. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a wonderful listening to you. I was just so deeply concentrating, like the way you were narrating everything and uh, so much to learn. So thank you so, so much. It's a wonderful presentation. So I just have a, I was just thinking, like considering the first law of Isaac Newton, uh, he said that every, you know, uh, force but you instead of force you said that influence mm -hmm. so following that uh, first law uh, i'm just curious if you if you could please share any uh, anecdote any story mm -hmm. uh, the real time story like how you influence uh, a strong character uh, in in any organization to to you know convince or uh, I mean, to convince with your perspective, with your doctorate, any any yes. any story would be beneficial. Yes, yes. and I, I do have a story. I shared this with, so I, I run my own meetup, um, just to put it out there. And I shared this story on Tuesday. So this is fresh in my mind, but this is always in my mind because this is a classic example of me going into an organization and using my secret sauce you know, what I've learned to do to really impact somebody that was so difficult. <laughs> so let me, I don't want to, I want to be careful like this because I can, in my meetup, I watched the video. It was like a long story. So I want to be mindful of the time. Um, I was working in an organization where um, I was an agile coach and I was over um, probably about 12 or 13 scrum masters. We were still hiring. Um, and one of them, after you know, working with her and coaching with her, she said, I'm having a problem with somebody on my team. Um, okay, um, <laughs> how can I help you? And she said, I really need to facilitate a retrospective, like a full team retrospective to see what the root cause is. I'm really scared because I'm a brand new Scrum Master. I've only been doing this a couple of months. 
Oh, you're welcome. Um, I've only been doing this a couple of months. I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. This person is intimidating to me. And this person is intimidating to everybody. And they are shutting everybody down. So everything ends up being this person doing all the talking and telling everybody what to do. And everybody just agrees. So, you know, you probably all experienced this before in your company. What do you do about this? And the key also here for me is I'm the agile coach. I'm not the scrum master. I'm not there to solve her problem. I'm there to give her a little bit of help so she can take the ball and run with it. Right. So I have to find that balance there. So she said initially, I want you to run this whole thing. And I said, well, <laughs> I'll do parts of it. Um, but I do want you to do other parts of it, right? This is a joint effort. And she said, okay. But when I first initially came into this, this Zoom room full of people, um, I don't know anybody. I don't have any trusting relationship with anybody. <laughs> they don't know who I am. And they're, they, the, the, the people in general in my field of vision were suspicious of agile coaches funny you say that patty what what does she want are we in trouble right that type of attitude what is she here to tell us to do that we're doing wrong so i know this coming in and i have to go into this group of people this group of strangers and immediately deflate that because i need to help them come to some type of resolution as a team so they can move past this impediment without pointing out the scrum master maybe can't do this herself yet that this person right over here is causing the problem but i have to navigate this and get this team talking and interacting so sorry this is getting to be long so we come into the zoom room and it's of course awkward nobody's saying anything and i'm just like okay i gotta change the momentum of this room so I started just telling a story, you know, there's this awkward, like five minutes mark, right? Where everybody's sitting there, whatever, waiting for the meeting to start. And I see, like, I live in a high rise in Charlotte. So this is my window. I see really weird stuff going down beneath me. So something catches my eye and I start saying, oh, people, guess what's going on outside my window? And then, you know, I'm my goofy self because I can't help myself. And then I say, oh, who else has an interesting story to tell, right? And people started awkwardly telling their stories, right? They're talking at me at this point. And I'm like, okay, Patty, you're not there yet. You're not there yet. And I'm waiting for the person, the person, right? That I need to be aware of. And all of a sudden this person starts talking. It was his turn. And I was like, that's him. Mm -hmm. He identified himself. He was being grumpy and, you know, whatever you want to call it, like, <clears throat> like, you know, I do my little imitations and I was thinking in my head, like he's talking and I'm nodding and I stopped hearing what he was saying. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? This is the guy I've got to facilitate this conversation. What do I do? <laughs> right. I'm thinking of this in my head, but I'm just calm. And then I noticed something in his background because it was winter time. And I saw there was a blizzard in the window behind his head. And I said, okay, I'm going to have the courage to ask this guy about the blizzard behind his head because I'm just so curious about it. And I am going to not be afraid that he's going to yell at me and be a jerk to me and tell me, Patty, shut up or whatever I'm imagining in my head. <laughs> so he's talking and then he stopped. I had no idea what he said, by the way. And I just said, hey, is it snowing in your background there? And he, I, I promised to the universe, he turned his laptop and said, yes it is snowing it is a blizzard out there and he started talking about the snowman that his kids built his energy and tone totally changed then other people started talking to him about that and the conversation started going and i'm like bingo patty you did it 
And it's like, I don't want to pat myself on the back, right? But it's like, that's what it takes. Understanding that I've, it's my responsibility to cut this tension, like, right? Because it's my job to get this team to start talking to each other so they can solve the problem, which is the sky, by the way. But I can't help them unless I cut this garbage that's going on in the room first. So my technique is to ask people in their Zoom backgrounds like about the things and they will start to get so excited that you ask because nobody ever asks. That shows you care about them. It's observation, so to speak. So that was a long story. I told you it was long. Yeah, well, thank you but so it, much. But it, it illustrates so, the point. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. When are we going to get a Netflix series from these oh, stories, gosh. Patty? <laughs> I would, I would uh, put that on my favorites for sure. That was a great story. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it, but it took courage. I can't tell you, even after all of these years, you know, you sit there and you're like, I'm so afraid that this person is going to shut me down, cut me off, call me a jerk, whatever it is, right? But you still have to have the courage because that's my role. Mm. And I never forget that. Mm. Great. All right, well, we've got just a couple more minutes. Anybody have another quick question for Patty? Anything at all? Bueller? <laughs> Throw me a tough one. Because <laughs> I will tell you, okay, in this meetup, right? I was doing a fireside chat with somebody that I know, like, and she turned the table, because I was interviewing her. She turned the table on me and said, I have a question for you, Patty. And she asked me that exact question that Abby, tell me about a time, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, this is real. Like I'm being put on the spot, but like, I got to put my money where my mouth is. So feel free. I'll so shove it in there. You, what led you from education, especially you were, sounds like you were doing um, early education, right? What, yeah. What, Actually, uh, I did higher. I was doing, I was teaching middle school science. Middle school science. So how does one get from middle school science to where you are today? Super question. Um, as I mentioned, I was doing agile and scrum and Kanban-ish stuff in my classroom, but I took it as far as I could. I, I bumped up against impediments and you might say, well, and I, I was a different person at the time. So I, like, let's be transparent about that. Right now I would say, okay, I don't advise you giving up, but I took it as far as I possibly could. This was back in the early to mid 2000s. Agile Scrum wasn't a thing. I mean, maybe in the software industry and in Silicon Valley and, and such, but those concepts were really brand new. They weren't widespread. I was doing this in my classroom. I was having great success, but you are still in a very structured waterfall environment. And I just felt, I, I can't do anything else more. And I left and I went into business and I built a whole nother set of skills that by the way, are a requirement for agile coaches. You've got to understand business. You've got to understand how things operate and how to change things on a business level and what motivations are of the business people because they're not the same as a developer. Right. And then I went into Scrum Mastering because I was doing that within the, the, the business that I was working at, just to clarify. Very cool. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, but Patty, thank you so much for joining Thanks. us. This was just such a pleasure. Really, really, as far as me personally, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, very, very, very useful and practical for me so thank you very much i see a lot of virtual claps going on so uh imagine a standing ovation here yes. all right well patty i know you would be willing to 
uh, entertain questions offline mm -hmm. if somebody was not comfortable sharing uh, sharing here in a group. So we shared your LinkedIn, um, your LinkedIn, how to get contact with you on LinkedIn. Uh, so that's there. Yep. And with that, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, and please, like, truly, 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 if you have feedback about this talk, give it to me because if there's something that needs to be explored further change, like I, I, I would love to know this. Um, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn and let me know what you thought, because like I said, this is going to be given again for the serious scrum conference. And I want to make sure like, it's like tip top shape. So Great. thank you so much. Thanks Patty. And thanks to everybody who came. We will see you next time. See you next month, y'all. Thank you.